So good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, today we have with us a person who needs no introduction, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the uh, country, and uh, founder and CEO of Zerodha. Uh, he's, uh, he's been a great disruptor, a huge disruptor in this country, making it easier for uh, everyone across the country to come and invest in the markets, uh, to participate in India's growth story and create wealth. Uh, He's, uh, uh, and, and that has led to uh, uh, significant changes. I mean, if you see the DMAT accounts in the country, in the last two years from four crore to 10 and a half crores now, uh, uh, retail investors are the backbone of Indian markets now, even though FBI is pull out, uh, uh, they, they, they stand behind. Uh, so we will talk about his, uh, we also have with us uh, uh, Samir Sodia. Uh, who's who's uh, uh, heading the foundation, the Rain Matter Foundation, uh, which is backed by Zerodha. So we'll talk uh, about Samir's, uh, uh, sorry, uh, about uh, uh, Nitin's uh, uh, path. And uh, but but the uh, the failure uh, behind his success. First, we'll like to touch that he he's he's been an immensible immensible. Uh, uh, immensely successful uh, entrepreneur. Uh, so, uh, if I may ask you, Nitin, uh, Zerodha is hugely successful, but over the path uh, w when you founded it and uh, uh, when you progressed on it and now uh, uh, at the stage that it is, can you talk to us about the failures that you had, some, uh, something that you really wanted to do uh, that you couldn't do, uh, and if you can touch upon that. Yeah, no, thanks uh, for having me here. You know, so I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm here, by the way. You know, so <laughs> I have more questions and answers about you know, some of these things. But, but yeah, about business, um, I think um, I had most of my failures, thankfully, before Zerodha. Uh, you know, I, I, I started trading the markets and becoming a sub broker, doing portfolio advisory. So I'd done 10, 12 years, I think, yeah, 12 years had went into building a career around uh, the stock markets. Uh, Zeroda only started in 2010. Uh, so all my, you know, like I keep wondering when, when you know, like when this whole roller coaster called life, right? As in I've seen a lot of downs and ups before, but generally the last four or five years have been like a trending up. So I keep, you know, we keep talking about it in the office, you know, when is the next, like the <laughs> down move in the roller coaster. So, uh, so the learnings from before, uh, See, I think I, I like you know a lot of people who are building businesses or wanting to build business. When they come ask me and they ask me, Nathan, what is the reason for the business has done well? Is one is you know we've been extremely lucky. You know we were at right place, right time, so many times. But more importantly, also I think you know I ended up trying to build a business around my core competencies, right? And I keep saying this, you know, like you need to kind of sharpen your axe before you go chop wood, right? So and and I didn't plan for it; it was accidental. So because I think you know ended up building a business around some core competencies, the odds of luck hitting you increased significantly, right? And, uh, and, uh, and building a business, you know, is, is like uh, growing a forest, you know, and it takes a long time, you know? So, you know, like this is something, you know, every time we meet, uh, you know, someone, who, you know, like any scientist, I you know, my, my question usually is, is there a way to quickly grow a forest? Like, you know, is there a way, you know, money can solve for the problem, right? And, and there isn't, you know, there is no quick way to do this, you know, and, uh, uh, and business is also like that. It takes a lot of, um, you know, a lot of time and effort and a lot of luck to kind of, you know, everything to come together. And uh, so yeah. So but but generally, uh, um, yeah, the experience. I think the biggest takeaway from my life, you know, when I look back, is you know, is that I got lucky maybe because I ended up doing business around something that I like, love to do. So you you said you started out as an investor. Now you provide a platform to all the investors. Were you yourself a successful investor? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so uh, the way Zeroda, I mean, we get credited, uh, you know, uh, Zeroda gets credited quite a bit for uh, building a bootstrap business. So we haven't raised any external capital. Uh, and the reason was because when we started the business, the money was really funded by our profits from before. So, you know, like my dad was a bank manager. So it's not like we came from wealth or something like that. So, uh, so we had done well between 2005 to 2010. Uh, we used that, used that seed kind of money as a seed capital to start a business. And uh, in 2011, 12, you know, the first one, two years of the business, uh, Nikhil, my younger brother, so what happened was when he started the business, uh, the plan was that I go and give a shot at build, building a better broker. 
and my younger brother continues trading. And if I'm not able to do my job well, I'll get back to trading again. I mean, that was really the backup plan. And uh, yeah, so that's really how Zeroda started. And uh, the first one, two years of the business uh, was funded by Nikhil's trading profits. Like, you know, he was at the back end, you know, investing in trading. And that's how we could remain bootstrapped uh, the first one, two years. Uh, but but that's it. You know your question. I kind of can understand what you're kind of hinting at, which is very few people you know trade, invest in the markets, and make money. And uh, well, that's so, so that's what. So you, did you make money uh, yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did I you mean, aspire to s to become a Rakesh Junjunwala? So the thing is, at some point, I realized that Nikhil, my younger brother, is a better trader than I am, right? So and it didn't make sense for both of us to sit and trade. And so the plan was he continues trading because he's more skilled than I am in terms of trading. And I, I you know, even before Zeroda, right, from early 2000, I was into this building communities of sorts. Uh, you know, I had the biggest Yahoo Messenger group in India on stock markets. Then Orkut started. I had the biggest Orkut community. You know, so, so I had this whole, you know, almost like this love to share capital market knowledge without any expectation. It was not like, you know, there was any monetization angle to it. And it was just, you, you used to write your blog because you like blogging, you know, so, uh, and, and not really that, you know, someone's gonna like, share, and things like that, you know. So, uh, so yeah, so I think I, I personally was more inclined towards, I think, building a broking business, and Nikhil continued trading. So Nikhil has gone ahead and started a hedge fund. So today, uh, you know, it's called True Beacon. And uh, so he took that, maybe the Rakesh Junjunwala path, and, you know, I took the, uh, but but we work together, you know. So you know, it's just that uh, as brothers, it's very important that we demarcate our territories, you know, and we don't get into, uh, you know, like trying to do what each other does. So I, I stopped trading once Zeroda started, and Nikhil does only trading. You know. So, but but does it still rub on somewhere that you were not a, you you didn't succeed that well? See, thing is, okay. So about trading, right? I mean, I think a lot of people mistake trading to trading stocks. Right? Trading is, I think, trading your time and effort where you got the best rewards on your time and effort. Right? I mean, trading, it could be trading stocks. I mean, if you're good at trading stocks, you trade stocks. If you're good at singing, you go sing. If you're good at building a broking business, you go build broking business. So, you know, when someone asks me, Nitin, how does it feel not trading? I say, Azaroda is my biggest trade of my life. Right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm really putting my time, effort, you know, sweat, blood, everything into this. So, so I think, I think trading isn't, you know, I mean, this is something that I keep trying to explain everyone that trading isn't trading stocks, you know. Uh, the only thing, the, the reason I think people get enticed to trading stocks is because it's very easy to trade stocks. You know, you can open an account in like two minutes and you can put money in it in five minutes and then you can start trading. The only easy thing about trading is opening a trading account and nothing else. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, what is it uh, still that, that uh, you think you have not been able to say, achieve something that, that you regret or something that you, you aspire to achieve? So when we started the business, you know, we were very active traders. We were trying to solve the problem that, you know, active traders need a platform with low cost and where the platform is transparent. Then it became about, we need to educate people. So we started Varsity, which is, a, which is probably one of the largest education initiatives on capital markets in the world. Um, then it became about platforms. So, you know, you need to offer better products and tools and utilities so customers can do better. And then, you know, we said, not everything we can do ourselves, so we need to, uh, you know, collaborate um, and, you know, maybe find ways to enable other people to build platforms. So Rain Matter Fintech started, which is our incubator. Uh, but then, you know, there's a question we've been asking over the last two, three years that, you know, we've done very well as a business, um, but what are we, what do we really exist for today, right? And, and the, the answer is that, you know, I think we need to, we need to be around because our customers should be able to do better with their money just because we exist, right? And and if we are not able to do it, there's no not even a point of us existing, right? And and that is really a very complex problem to solve, which is how do you help people do better with their money, right? Because everyone's influenced by their fear, their greed, their biases, and I mean their different biases. Like um, so, yeah, it's it's a tough problem. I had thought for a long time that education and good platforms will help it. But I, you know, after six, seven years of doing it, I've realized it's not, you know, I mean, I think uh, good platforms and education isn't enough for people to do better with their money. And uh, so, I mean, that's really the problem that we are trying to solve for over the last one, two, three years. Um, I think one hope has been for us is we've launched this platform called Nudge, which is like a user experience layer on top of trading app. 
Uh, think of it, I'll give you an example. Say a person who's making $1,000 a month of salary is trying to buy a 5,000 rupees phone on Amazon, right? What would Amazon do, right? As in, if, say, if you don't have the money, they'll say, you know, borrow money from me and take the phone. But it's not a right sale, right? Because a guy who earns $1,000 a month shouldn't be buying a $5,000 phone because it's not right for him financially. Can Amazon nudge the customer, and nudge that person and say, dude, you should not be buying this. What are you smoking? You know, go buy a thousand dollar phone or five hundred dollar phone, right? As in, right? Can we do that? Is a question, and and that's something that we are attempting as a business, right? That so that is where uh, I wanted to come in because you provide the platform where a lot of youngsters are coming and investing, and especially taking the options and derivatives routes. Yeah. So uh, we have seen numerous examples where they have even lost money, especially over the last two years when when the markets were rising, people were taking all kinds of bets. Now. Where, while you provide the platform, you, you, you have lowered the entry barrier for anybody and everybody to come and enter and uh, invest. H how do you safeguard there when, when people come? Where, yeah. I mean, that, no, that's I, mean I, I get it, yeah. So, so the thing is, I think one of the qualms over the last two, three years has been uh, is this whole rise of the influencer and, and the rise of setting wrong expectations out there. You know, this whole setting expectation that you know you can somehow make quick easy money from the stock markets which is absolutely bullshit you know i mean there is no quick easy money to be made in the stock markets you know it's probably the hardest place in the world to make easy money you know so uh, and and that expectation you know once the problem is when when someone enters the market with the wrong expectation he's going to all his decisions are going to be based on that and if you come with the expectation that you can make 100% return on a year all your trades will be wanting to get 100% return which means you're going to take more risk you will trade more speculatively and, and all of that, right? As in, but if people come to the markets with the, with the right expectations, it's, you know, the chance of the person doing well with the money also increases. And, and this is something that we have constantly tried, even with the nudge platform. You know, the first nudge that we introduced was this penny stock nudge, right? Because a lot of first timers think a stock at five rupees is cheaper than a stock at 500 rupees, right? Which is absolutely wrong, right? As in, you know, a value of a stock is based on the underlying asset, right? So. So what we did in, uh, is that you know today when you go on Kite, our trading app, and you try to buy a penny stock, we kind of scare the shit out of the customers saying, dude, what are you doing? You know, I mean, like, what is, you know, do you even know this stock company doesn't exist? Now, it is not paternalistic, right, in the sense we don't disallow a guy from taking the trade because, you know, that's not our job, right? But we are, we are doing a business of saying, alerting him, saying, this is a penny stock. Do you even at least know this? And our penny stock trading volumes are down 70%, you know, from the time we introduced this nudge. Uh, now, coming to futures and options, this are, these are leveraged trades, right? And uh, like you, you know, li rightly said, you know, the, if people don't trade it well, the, uh, you know, the consequences are not that great. And that's one of the reasons why we have constantly gone out there and set the expectation. And I, I don't know how many times I've publicly said less than 1% of our customers make more than fixed deposit returns. You know, people who trade, you know, speculatively, you know, trading futures and options, etc. The idea being, you set the expectations right, then people come to the business for the right reasons. Um, a lot of people ask me, dude, why would you do it as a broker? Because you will lose business, right? But I will lose business if you think about it in a quarter on quarter context. I rather make 100 rupees from a customer over 20 years, than make 2000 rupees in one month, right? But, but the problem I think, you know, in the industry or, you know, in the capitalistic, uh, world is everyone's working quarter on quarter targets, right? So everyone will do what is right for the quarter. Uh, you know, the decision making framework is like that, right? As in, I need to get to my quarterly goals if whatever it takes. Um, and then you, you kind of, you know, when you optimize for what is right for the short term, it's usually not right for the long term. And, and today as Zeroda, I think we have the freedom to not think short term and, and think long term because we don't have investors. There is no revenue target. There is no ta growth target. So. So yeah, so we are, we are consciously trying hard, but uh, but I think uh, I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I, I mean, if you were to ask me, have we done a good job at it? M maybe not. You know, I mean, there is still a lot to do here. And uh, uh, like you know, until now, we have taken a stance that we are a platform. We don't care what happens. But over the last one two years, we have said that you know, uh, your moral. I mean, you have an obligation to the customer. You cannot just you know, kind of say that I don't care what the customer does. You know, so this is this. Uh, this is something that we've been working on and every single thing that we are building as a business over the last two years is with this objective saying we need to help people do better with the money. And, and
And is this something that that is uh, that you see within the industry, your 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 peers, and is is the thought process there, or or are you taking the lead in that? No, I mean, see, the thing is, uh, see, all my peers, right? Either there are uh, paid CEOs, right, or there are founders who have, you know probably hold five ten percent stake in the business. They cannot take this stance. You know, they you know they're not in a position to take this stance because. You know, if you're a CEO, if you don't perform well for the next two quarters, he's going to lose his job. No one's going to ask, dude, what your decision's going to work out in the next five, ten years or not, right? Um, so similarly, you know, if you're, uh, you know, um, if you're someone who diluted a lot of capital, you've raised, uh, yeah, so you've raised money and you've raised money selling a certain story of growth and, and et cetera. So you cannot suddenly tomorrow say, you know what, I, I don't think this is right, but but one of the things you know, like you know, Samir and I keep talking about this, is that today because of the success of the business, I think I'm in a position to peer pressure people into doing some things, right? In the sense, if I come and say this very openly, you know, I'm sure you know if it's recorded, put out there, some of my comp you know, competitors will listen to it. Now, can they, you know, somehow not think about some of these things that I'm saying? You know, so so I think I think we can peer pressure. You know, like. Uh, I think we were one of the first companies to do a ESOP buyback, and then what we did it, and then it, you know there were like 30 other companies who did it, right? So, um, so like that, you know, I think I think today, you know, you know, we have a influence on others, and one of the one of the objectives of the Rain Matter Foundation also is that is that eventually, you know, people will start asking questions: if Zeroda is doing this, why are you not doing this? <laughs> so, I mean, that is one of the you know uh, agendas of, of of doing this as well, you know. So, so I'll get Samir in as well. I'm sorry, I kept you waiting. Uh, so, uh, besides uh, creating wealth for people, uh, Mr. Kamath is also uh, touching millions of lives uh, through his uh, Rain Matter Foundation that he founded two years back, and uh, it's it's doing work on climate. Uh, Samir is is the CEO of that. Uh, Samir, you are here for the last two years. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, uh, so so. What have your uh, your experiences uh, besides climate that you're working right now? What all what all have you have you tried? And uh, is is climate really working right now? Because uh, as we see, the social concerns of this country are so much on education, healthcare, and all that. Climate really doesn't get that that kind of uh, uh, the focus, so as to say. So how would you put that? So thanks, thanks, Adib. Um, so yeah, climate is a hyper complex problem, right? And it's it's in everything. There's there's no climate problem per se. It's in health and it's in education and livelihoods. It's in uh, our supply chains and businesses and stock exchanges <laughs> and all of that, right? Like Nitin and I have this uh, ongoing joke about if this doesn't work, the stock exchange is dead, and if it works, the stock exchange is dead anyway, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, the I, th I think. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a it's a problem, the size of the planet, literally. Um, and uh, in this in 2022, we have realized that uh, we are likely not staying below two degrees, right? Um, so it's got failure rate all over it, right? So uh, why would you pick it up? You know, why would you pick up something as audacious and stupid as that? Right? I think I think, but uh, um, it's it's the same thing, right? Like. See, what, what Nitin was describing was an, kind of an audacious goal. You want to become the biggest player in this while being right by the customer. It's a very simple principle, right? You apply it to everything you do, every, every thought you have, every design you do, but you keep doing that. Uh, some of the outcomes will be failure, some of the outcomes will be success, right? That'll keep happening, right? But if you, if you latch onto a set of principles and keep doing that, and I think it's the same thing with climate because it's a it's a super complex problem. It it affects everything. It is it is by definition in the intersections, right? It needs uh, civil society, governance, a lot of players with social capital, a lot of innovators, a lot of different people to come together. Can one foundation? Can one set of people solve it? I don't think so. Can can we start applying these principles, popularizing the ideas, talking to? as many people as we can. I think that's what we can do right now. So that's what we're doing. Uh, Nitin, what was the idea behind, I mean, choosing, going for climate? When, when there are so many, when, when we see CSR spends of companies, we see healthcare education coming right on top. Uh, why did you go for, go for climate? Yeah, so um, see, the thing is, firstly, the idea of Rain Matter Foundation came when 
there was a lot of success as a business, right? And and uh, and then you know, I mean, this has always bothered me about this whole concentration of wealth problem, and um, and I somehow think it's only only going to get you know worse with time because I've realized how how much more easier it is for me today to make money versus within ten years back, right? Because the opportunities are so much more, you know, you can leverage on your capital so much more. Um, so I think I think money will keep going away from the masses to the top, and uh, and I think if the people where the wealth is getting concentrated don't do enough, um, I think I mean I, I don't know how this ends well. I, there's no good outcome, right? As in eventually this will end bad. And again, right? You know, if you think about it in long enough uh, horizon, like you know, if you think about this like 20 years, 30 years from now. I mean, what's the point of all of this wealth if tomorrow there's a civil war somewhere, right? As in, I mean, if you can't walk on the street, what's the point? I mean, you're already seeing this in some cities and right around the world, right? So, so yeah. So I think I think tomorrow the question will be asked of people who had the wealth and who had the wherewithal to do something when shit hits the fan tomorrow, right? And um, and and you have to be ready. I mean, like you know. So I I don't want to be in a position 20 years from now where say my son comes to me and asks Nathan, Dad, whatever you know, you had all the resources uh, 20 years back when the world was going to dogs and why didn't you do anything about it then, right? I mean, that's how the, the idea that we have to do something about this, uh, you know, this whatever wealth is getting concentrated should be used for the betterment of society in some way, you know, is, is how it started. Uh, one of the triggers for this is also, you know, like my life guru is, you know, Kailash, who's our CTO, right? And, uh, uh, you know, I, because I'm a trader, you know, I started my whole life with wanting to buy a Porsche and, you know, like, you know, like a house with a swimming pool, you know, I mean, that was my, like, you know, like my driving ambition for, for five, ten years of my life. But once Kailash joined and I, you know, kind of hung around him, and you know, I started questioning about a lot of these things. And, uh, and yeah, so the two problems that we could associate with, you know, one was, at Zero the Right, one of the reasons we are so successful in terms of our profits and et cetera is because we've grown very efficiently. Right, uh, so we were 1,100 people on the team when we were a million customers. We are 1,100 members on the team with 11 million customers. Right, we have not had to hire people. Right, now the thing is, you know, you would say amazing, right? As in, you made a lot of profits, but, but in my head, I'm thinking, what about all those jobs that potentially you could have created 10 years back if you were kind of running this business inefficiently? I don't know. It's, it sounds weird, but. Um, uh, but yeah, but 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 the thing is, I mean, these kind of questions started coming. Uh, so one was livelihood creation, yeah. right? And I think which is a big problem in this country. And then when we were thinking about it, uh, we realized that if you're going to create jobs, how do you create jobs in, in this country, right? As in, where where will the jobs come? And maybe you know, we said maybe it has to be green in color. You know, if, if you're creating more jobs, it should be. And then this whole idea of uh, you know climate change livelihood came. I mean, it was all over the place. Then, you know, one day I said, you know, we can't keep thinking, we have to get our hands dirty. Uh, we found a restoration pro project in, uh, like, you know, there was this, like, 100-acre piece of land near Krishnagiri. You know, we drove down one day and we said, you know what, okay, I mean, the easiest thing, you know, when someone says climate change is plant trees, right, as in grow a forest. I mean, everyone understands that, right? So, uh, you know, so a bunch of us went and we said, let's take this, you know, let's buy this out because someone is planning to turn it into one of those villa projects. We said, you know, you cannot let that happen. So, and then Samir was running a campsite in that property. And that's really how we met, you know. So, I mean, us, you know, getting our hands dirty led to, you know, Samir joining us and then Samir helping us kind of uh, define what, how this should be thought about because, uh, but because, you know, we have full-time jobs. I mean, we are right now two-timing this, you know, in the sense a bunch of us from Zeroda. So, so we, we said that we, you know, we can't really, we don't really have the bandwidth to do this. So, so yeah, so um, from that original thesis, I mean, it's kind of evolved into something else today. And I think Samir will be the right person for that. <laughs> uh, Samir, if I may ask you, uh, are there a couple of ventures that you've funded or, or some projects that you've undertaken that are really proud of, that have taken off, or, or you think you haven't st still been able to sort of, you've just scratched the surface and not, not have been able to do any meaningful work? No, I think we are proud of all of them. I mean, the people are doing some amazing work out there, right? And uh, we, we are merely funding them, right? Like, but uh, are, are there specific some examples um, that you can... Like, uh, there's Akshay Kalpa that we are, we are involved in a big way. And, uh, uh, you know, what's happening at the farm is uh, 
um, it's just amazing, right? It's also creating great livelihoods and great incomes at the uh, village level. But uh, the resilience at the farm, the resilience for, um, you know, the natural asset building at the farm itself, that's, that's just amazing. Then there's uh, many organizations uh, like NCF working in conservation, um, people working in water, people working on uh, uh, restoration, large restoration projects in Maharashtra, sea trees around here. Uh, you know, there's, there's also people who are uh, working on policy. There are people working um, on, on solutions because uh, like Nathan was saying, we, we need more green livelihoods, right? Our, our economy has to get more regenerative for solving this. It's not just going to come from a simple energy transition and a mobility transition. Right? So we're trying to stitch all of this together. Right? I think we have miles to go in that. Right? So while we are very proud of, I mean, we are, we are thankful to all the folks who are doing this out there, I think we have miles to go on this. I, I don't think we have, we have started to crack this yet. Can I seek permission from organizers to go on for 10 more minutes? Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, take a couple of more questions and then I'll open the floor for a couple of more uh, from, from you. Now, on the CSR bit, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, India Inc. has been, because of the mandatory uh, rules that are there, the 2% uh, of the profits that they have to contribute, over the last seven years, almost one lakh crore has been spent by India Inc. In fact, in 2020, 21, it was around 25,000 crore. Do you see the impact of all that money, or uh, despite spending, we are failing? If you can. <laughs> no, yes, Samir is going to answer that. All right. <laughs> um, so I think, I think the, uh, so I'm, I'm speaking from a climate lens largely. Uh, I've, I've also. But, but also, given that you are in that sphere, yeah. I mean, do you see enough work is happening, all that money is being spent? Are climate we, are we has seeing the impact to, of that? Yeah, climate has started to become important. Uh, for CSR and philanthropy in the last, over the last year, uh, especially as world events have caught up and made it um, headlines all the time. Um, but even generally, I think intersectional thinking is coming into play a lot more today. You hear about it a lot more. Earlier it was very siloed, saying I'm doing health or I'm doing livelihoods and I'm, or I'm doing X or Y or Z. People are at least paying some lip service to the idea of intersections today. Right? That's happening. The discussions are happening. Uh, I think the effectiveness will grow, because today you can spend on energy and worsen water. You can spend on income and actually worsen livelihoods and worsen, uh, you know, the health numbers for any place. So like somebody asked us, what happens to the place when you, when you fix one variable and, you know, destroy th three others, what are you doing to the place? Right, so that, that holistic approach or, or a slightly more holistic approach to problem solving, I think that's, that question is setting in. The systems thinking for that has become a little bit of a buzzword. But I think the tools are coming into play. And uh, I think problem, and, and you're also starting to see some collaboration in, in the Indian philanthropy and CSR space. So I, I, as this starts to happen more, the quality of the problem solving will improve dramatically. And uh, I mean, it, it, it's sad I have to say it, but that uh, climate is a great way to bring this together because it, it cuts across almost everything that we see. Nathan, your thoughts on that? No, you don't want to touch? touch no, I mean, see, the thing is, uh, I haven't, uh, I mean, I... When you see around, just look at Bangalore lakes. Right. Why should it become national news every year? Right. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> you're getting me. No, I haven't, I, I haven't really tried to map out if all the money has gone to the right places. Like, uh, no, I haven't, I haven't thought through. Uh, now that you've spoken about it, I will, I'll think about it. But, but yeah, but I, I, somehow it seems like the impact isn't there. But the thing is, you're talking a problem of 150 crore people. Like, a lakh crore, maybe not enough to even impact 150 crore people, right? As in no, that's what, are you seeing, at least of that, are we seeing that, is, is, it, is it happening the way? No, that's what, so the thing is, I think, I think to solve India's problem, you probably need a lot more money, right? I mean, a lakh crore rupees is probably enough for a country with 10 million population, and maybe not one point. I'm, I'm, I'm talking like a businessman, right? I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying if 150 crore people are there and, um, and there is one lakh crores, 
I mean, I don't know. I mean, incrementally, I don't know how much you can use that much money to create a difference in 150 crore people's life. Maybe it's not enough. Or maybe it's not really going to the right places. I, I really, you know, I don't have an answer to this because I haven't, I haven't really thought about this. Uh, uh, recently, one more trend has started that we see earlier companies used to take the project and execute it, like you are doing through your foundation. Now people are giving the money to PM Cares Fund and they are just saying, okay. Now, how do you see that, that sort of, uh, because then uh, if you aspire to do something to bring a meaningful ch impact or change in say, society or, 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 or to the city that you belong to, if you, if you, if you, if you don't make, get your hands dirty into it, then. See, the thing is, I, you know, we were <laughs> coincidentally discussing on something similar lines. So I think, uh, like, I know a lot of my friends who are entrepreneurs who've done well and who have an intent to give back and, or, or give forward or invest for the future, right? Uh, but I think, I think there is like a trust barrier, right? And uh, so whatever mandatory is required, you know, they'll go do it, I think, wherever is the most trust that lies, right? And, and maybe it's, it's, you know, the question is also for the other side, is saying, are, is the social sector doing enough to build trust amongst entrepreneurs to allocate capital to them? Right, because I can tell you that a lot of new wealth, at least you know, in Bangalore, a lot of these people are willing to go ahead and, like you know, like people like me, isn't? I mean, I you know, at some point we said you know we need to get our hands dirty and we can't allocate money without knowing what we're doing, right? Uh, but not not everyone has a time, bandwidth, resources to be able to get to get their hands dirty, right? So they will they will really do what is the easiest thing to do, which is to allocate money to someone else, and amongst allocating to someone else. The most trusted is, is, you know, is government. I mean, like, you, you, I mean, like, like if I want to buy, if I want to keep my money in the safest place, I'll go buy tax-free bonds. I mean, I will not, you know, or I'll buy, you know, government securities. I wouldn't, you know, even go put it in HDFC bank or whatever, right? So it's, it's like that, you know. So uh, I think, I think that's, I think the, the uh, I think a lot more has to be done for the social sector to kind of garner trust because I think, I think capital will flow if, if that were to happen, you know. Uh, I can take a couple of questions if, yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, my question might be a little naive, so excuse me. Um, the, I like the, you guys work on climate and you all want to set up new green jobs. But the new green jobs makes me a little uncomfortable in itself. You come from an old industry that's bringing in money into a new industry, when will the old industry itself change to become more green? And uh, do you think it's like this and, are there two different worlds or are we in one world? <laughs> no, I mean, I think, like I said, you know, like I, start, you know, I have more questions in my life than answers right now. You know? So, uh, see the thing is, as a business, wherever we've, uh, you know, we have had an opportunity to go green, we have done it. Like, you know, when COVID happened, I think the first thing kind of we realized is that, um, like, you know, the problem is, uh, we never thought that work from home ever can work, right? But as soon as we realized work from home works, we decided we should go permanent work from home, right? Because we said, you know, these, out of 1,100 people, like 800 people are outside Bangalore, right? So there are 800 families lesser choking the city. Right, and, uh, and these people are now in smaller towns and villages, and they're creating economies out there. So in my head, I think it's a greener job. I mean, is it green? I don't know, right? But the fact that they're probably consuming much lesser than what they would in, 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 in a city like Bangalore, they're probably creating an economy around them, and probably their quality of life also has gone up, right? As in, I mean, so yes, yeah, so I, 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 think, I think like, for example, I mean, we can really do whatever we can. I mean, uh, now, newer green jobs, I don't know, I mean, like I said, you know, I, I have, we're trying to support a bunch of causes, we're trying to learn along the way. I, I don't know if I have the answers, I know, Samir, if you have anything around. Yeah, so it's like you born into a network of current functions and roles and, you know, things around you. We are sitting in a very well-lit auditorium with central air conditioning on a nice cool day in Bangalore, right? We make all these trade-offs. You're going to use coal to fi find your way to renewables, right? So there's a, there's a path. I think if we can imagine a new network and keep chipping away at it at some scale, 
The main thing is it has to start mainstreaming. So the government comes in in a big way over there, right? Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a hard binary. Uh, yes, we have to get rid of the old world, of the current old world, right? Uh, can we, have we imagined the new world? Uh, are, are, we, are we moving fast enough to get there at scale uh, for my and his kids to um, have enough tools to deploy when we are gone? I think, I think those are questions. I mean, we don't have answers to, but we're hoping we'll get there. Uh, question from there, yeah. Hello. Yeah, Namaskar. Uh, I'm Satya from Odisha. Uh, my question is that actually with the regards to the CSR fund, uh, last year you were sharing, uh, we have seen in Odisha because uh, with the FC uh, fund earlier it was coming, uh, we have seen uh, near about 10,000 crores something. But now the CSR fund is heavy. But as, uh, as in Odisha also we are looking, the most of the CSR fund are utilized in uh, urban development. Even if they are uh, imposed by the government, uh, different departments and they are using it. Instead of uh, rural development, specifically for the tribals and all things, we should go, go forward actually to the, even if it through the uh, civil society organization, but which is not going actually properly. And uh, so this is the big challenge actually, because what is your view on this actually? But CSR fund is heavy, uh, like, uh, like more than 20,000 crores. Uh, so which can be, the rural can be developed very better way. Thank you for your views. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, there, there's a wonkiness to, uh, even in uh, aspirational districts, apparently only six of the, all, all the aspirational districts get over half the funding. So it's, it's not well distributed. And there are, we are, we are working with, we are working with think tanks and partners who are trying to address this. We are working with people who are uh, trying to work with CSR. I mean, our interest is to, of course, bias them towards being pro-biodiversity, pro-climate in all their interventions. Right? But as part of this, these problems do come up. Yes. Okay, we'll squeeze in one last question here, please. Hi. Uh, this is actually for both of you. Nitin, as you look back, um, with growing Zeroda, if there was something that you wish you had done entirely differently, what would that be? And then even with setting up the foundation, right? Are there, I know it's a young foundation, but are there things that you look back that you think you would have thought about differently or done differently? And can you tell us about that? So, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, I, I think about what I would say, you know, if I go back in time, what will I change? I don't think I'll change anything because you know, I've just been so lucky so many times that any small change, I think I'll not be here today, you know, so I'm, I'm al almost fearful about, about that, you know, so, um, uh, so yeah, so I, I mean, I think, I think uh, we've made mistakes, etc. but if we had not made mistakes, I don't think we would have done, taken actions that we did, you know, so, um, so I can't, I can't, like, you know, I, I keep thinking about it, like, what will I change? I think about going back to school, you know, in my 10th standard, if I had studied well for my maths exam, would, you know, <laughs> you know, with my mom. But I don't think I would be here, you know, I would have probably done engineering from a good college and then gone become something else, you know. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I, uh, I, can't, I can't really think of what I could have done differently, you know. So. I think it's the same for the foundation. I mean, uh, I, think, I think it's a common DNA in, in everything Zerodha touches now. Uh, it's, it's about foundational principles. I mean, if you, you can get too weighed by trying to measure it as failure and success, or success as well, because we are sometimes too eager to define success. So the joke is that, assume that you, are, you have only three years to go, and you're, you're dead, dead after that, right? So plan for three years. Have a 20-year have a vision, as, as he was describing, for the customers as well. But uh, you know, plan your actions for three years. Don't assume you're going to be around for three years. So don't get too hung up on success or failure. Uh, arrive at a decent set of principles that you can keep working with on a continuous set and evolve. Uh, we are in the middle of a, a fairly large rethink and redo structurally and organizationally. But, but that's what you wake up and you know, do on any given morning. Okay, I know there are many more questions, but I think you can address to him, them, them directly to him. Uh, with that, we bring this session. So you can just you can ask after he's, <laughs> he's around. He's around. We won't let him go. So you can you can ask him your questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for the. Uh, let's let's now go on to the next session. Yeah. Thank you so much.